Well, in this video, we come to the final section in John chapter 7. This whole scene has been set in Jerusalem in the temple courts during the Festival of Tabernacles. And here, this passage starts on the last and the greatest day of the festival. The sermon I preached on this section I called, Let Anyone Who Is Thirsty Come. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you just to take some time, read through these verses, familiarize yourself with the story, um, mark down any questions that you might have, look for repetition, look for key ideas that jump out of the text as you read it. And spend some time praying that God, by His Spirit, would open your eyes to see and understand wonderful truths about Him and the way He works in the world. Now, it's helpful just to understand a little bit of context about uh, this last and greatest day of the festival. Reading the commentator Don Carson on John's Gospel, I found his comment really helpful. And he explains that on that day, historically, it had developed that the priest would go to the Pool of Siloam and take a golden jug of water and carry it up to the temple while the people were singing from Psalm 113 all the way to Psalm 118. And it was a real celebration, looking back to God's provision of water to his people while they were in the wilderness. But it was also looking ahead to the day when God would pour out his spirit on his people, as prophesied in Isaiah 44 and Ezekiel 37. And Zechariah 12 and 13, this longed for spirit being poured out was something that God's Old Testament people had been longing for. And still in Jesus' day, they were longing for the outpouring of God's spirit. So that setting on the last and greatest day of the festival really gives a great focus to what's taking place in this section. And the key verses are very much these verses here and to include in that uh, John's explanation that by this he meant the spirit. Uh, J.C. Ryle speaks of these as words that should be uh, written in gold letters because of the richness of what these truths contain. Now it's useful just to look at our characters again. So our key character in the story uh, being a gospel about Jesus is the Lord Jesus himself. And some speculation about who he is from the crowds. Then we've got uh, the people, uh, the crowds, some of the people. The Pharisees call them a mob. Very derogatory. We have the temple guards. We have the chief priests and Pharisees. Rulers. Of whom Nicodemus was one. There's a number of discussion about Galilee and some misunderstanding about Galilee and who comes from Galilee. In John's Gospel, remember, we remember John 20, verse 30 and 31, and that gives us John's key for writing this, that he's giving us evidence, which calls for belief, calls us to believe in Jesus, and by believing in Jesus, you might have life. And so throughout this Gospel, we're looking for um, evidence about Jesus that calls us to believe in Jesus. And we see Jesus say, whoever believes in me, those who believe in him were later to receive the Spirit. And Jesus says, whoever believes in him, as Scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now, the reason this setting is so important is because on the last and greatest day of the festival, they were showing their longing for the day that God would come and quench the spiritual thirst in their souls. And now Jesus comes to them and says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. That's a poetic way of calling people to believe in him, to believe that he is the one who came to quench that spiritual thirst in their souls. 
But the glorious thing we see in this passage is not only is Jesus offering himself, in chapter 4, he also spoke of this living water and the Samaritans there said, well, have we found the savior of the world? This picture is growing that not only is Jesus the savior of the world who offers living water, but he also says that the rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit. So Jesus came to quench that spiritual thirst in our souls by giving not only himself to save us, but also by giving us his spirit to live in us. Now, John gives the explanation that at this stage, Jesus hadn't yet been glorified. But for us, sitting this side of the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, he's now seated on his throne in glory. So all those who believe in him have received this spirit. We have this living water flowing from within us. The truth about Jesus flows out from us. This is picking up on an image that we see in Ezekiel 47, with the waters flowing from the temple to the ends of the earth. God's truth is now flowing from us. The truth about Jesus, the one who came to save us, who we need to believe in and find life in his name, that truth by the Spirit flows from us who believe. Tragically, though, in this section, we see a number of responses. We see the response of the people in the first section, and John summarizes that response in verse 43 when he said, the people were divided because of Jesus. Although some seem to be leaning towards the possibility that he is the Messiah, there is great confusion about him. Uh, they really understand the scriptures well. They say, does not the scriptures say? And Jesus says, as the scriptures have said, he wants them to dig into the word. And they say here, look into it. In other words, look into the scriptures and find the truth. Jesus is saying, actually, all the truth is pointing to him. He is the one that all scriptures were pointing to. But they misunderstood the scriptures. They say, doesn't the scripture say that the Christ, the Messiah, will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem? If they had really looked into it, they would have seen the answer. Yes, in Micah 5 verse 2, we are told that the Messiah would come from the town of Bethlehem and be a descendant of David. And that's exactly who Jesus was. He wasn't from Galilee. Yes, he may have been ministering in Galilee in the time leading up to this, but he was a descendant of David, born in Bethlehem. But instead of believing, they were divided because of him. And then in the second section, we see uh, the chief priests and the temple guards, this interaction between them. Uh, the temple guards seem also to be leaning toward believing in Jesus. They say no one ever spoke the way this man does. Uh, he was, after all, the Word, who we met in chapter 1 of John's Gospel. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that very powerful Word who spoke creation into being, it was his words they were listening to. So maybe they felt uh, that, that thirst that they knew needed to be quenched. Maybe they began to realize that this man was the one to quench that thirst. But the Pharisees retorted, as he deceived you also. They will absolutely not believe that this is the one who came to quench that spiritual thirst within them. Even Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, you can read about him in John chapter 3. Uh, go back and watch that video. And we see Nicodemus questioning. Maybe he is the one who's come from God. Maybe he is the Christ. Now, there's no indication yet whether he has believed. But by the time we get to John 19, he's among those who believe in Jesus. He's there with Joseph of Arimathea, placing Jesus' body in the tomb, counted among those who trusted that this man was the Christ. But at this stage, he's just raising a concern. Does our law not condemn a man? Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him and finding out what he's been doing? And they reply, are you from Galilee too? They just ridicule him. And then he says, look into it and you will find out that a prophet doesn't come. 
from Galilee. Again, there's great irony in that because if you look into it, um, Jonah came from Gath Hepha, which is in Galilee, which you can find in 2 Kings 14 verse 25. Um, Nahum came from El Kosh, which is also in Galilee. You can find that in uh, Nahum 1 verse 1. And even Elijah came from Tishbe, which was probably also in Galilee. Uh, so there were prophets who came out of Galilee, significant prophets. But instead of using the scripture to, to see that Jesus was the Messiah they had been longing for, the one who came to quench their thirst, instead of believing him and finding life in his name, they used the scriptures uh, actually to turn away from him. Uh, the way they understood the scriptures blinded them to the truth that those scriptures were meant to reveal to them. And so the great tragedy here is that these people and these leaders of the, the Jews wouldn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. And yet this invitation goes out. A glorious, glorious invitation in these verses. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. A poetic way of saying believe. And those who believe, these rivers of life will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit. And the Spirit would empower his believing people to take this truth. It would overflow from them to the ends of the earth. As Ezekiel had prophesied, these rivers would flow from the temple, the new temple, God's people. The truth about Jesus would flow from us to others. And John has written this down to give us evidence. It's evidence about people who don't believe. But he wants to show us this wrong response to Jesus so that we might believe that he is who he says he is and by believing find life in his name. John wants all his listeners to come and to realize that Jesus came to quench the spiritual thirst in our souls by giving us not only himself, but also his spirit, God with us, God in us. We have this evidence, believe it, find life in his name. And as these rivers of living water flow from within us, we hold out this invitation to others. We say to others, Jesus came and said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And we want people to come, to find life in Jesus by believing in him. The evidence is there. We are called to hold it out. As you spend some more time reflecting on this, just spend some time just meditating on these truths. They are glorious truths uh, to grow our love for Jesus, that he's the one who came to quench this deep spiritual thirst within us. And we receive not only salvation through him, but his spirit living within us, empowering us to hold out this truth to a thirsty world. God bless as you dig in further.